Well, good morning and uh, welcome from uh, Central Florida. I'm speaking, uh, I think, three days in the past. It's Wednesday here and a hurricane is heading our way. Right now, it's not raining yet. But um, if we were to record this, uh, try to record this a day or two from now, we might be without power. So it's good that we're able to do this right now. Uh, I wish I could be there. And uh, I, I hope um, you all enjoy the conference. My topic is the relevance of Meredith G. Klein. In February 1953, Meredith Klein published an article entitled The Relevance of the Theocracy in the popular magazine, The Presbyterian Guardian. The Guardian, which ran from 1935 to 1979, was a popular uh, magazine for an OPC audience that was more or less the precursor to the Presbyterian, I'm sorry, to the New Horizons. For the 30-year-old assistant professor at Westminster, it was his first published article, which might explain why the Guardian misrepresented him in the byline as Meredith J. Klein. Here, Klein draws a distinction between the sphere of common grace, which we inhabit, that has institutions like church and state, and the sphere of the consummation, which is characterized by a theocracy. We must honor this distinction, Klein writes, if we are to understand the Old Testament and its bearing for living the Christian life today. This is a difference of kind, not of degree. Put simply, where there is common grace and common curse, there is no theocracy. And where there is theocracy, there's no common grace. Now, how does this help us understand the nation of Israel established in the Mosaic Covenant? Klein answers by citing Gerhardus Voss. He writes the significance, quoting Voss, the significance of the unique organization of Israel, Voss is writing in his biblical theology, can rightly be measured only by remembering that the theocracy typified nothing short of the perfected kingdom of God, the consummate state of heaven. The theocracy was an anticipatory intrusion of the eschaton. Now, errors ensue, Klein explains, when this distinction is not honored. In this particular article, he goes on to critique two popular articles current at the time, identifying the flaws of their authors. This initial uh, article of Klein in print is a bit dated, and he'd go on to write many more uh, memorable articles and several, several deeply profound books. But what stands out in this article is this quote from Voss. It demonstrates that at the very start of um, Klein's publication efforts, he is eager to approach biblical theology in the tradition of the one he called the Prince of Exegetes. In the spirit of Voss, Klein concludes the article by urging that the systematic theologian is always obliged to stop, look, and listen to the voice of biblical theology. But there is something even more significant about this article. Toward the end, Klein notes that, and I quote, wide enough is the application of Voss's thesis. How wide? Well, here is my suggestion. It is no exaggeration in my judgment to say that Klein would devote the next half century Indeed, his entire academic career expanding and refining the consequences of Voss's claim. What I plan to do this morning is to survey the life of Meredith Klein with a particular view of how he develops his Vossian theme. The leading developer of Voss's Old Testament biblical theology is not what anyone would imagine when looking at Klein's birth and childhood. Meredith Klein was born nearly a century ago, on December 15, 1922, in Copley, Pennsylvania. Copley was, then, and still is, a small community in Lehigh County, about six miles north of Allentown. It was transitioning in the early 20th century from a farming community into an industrial economy with the arrival of an ironworks factory. And this is what attracted Harry Klein, Meredith's father, 
who was a boat worker who migrated from Boston to Brooklyn and to Copley during and after World War I. When Meredith was four, his family moved to Dorchester, a neighborhood in Boston near the Back Bay, where Harry Klein joined a family painting business. One of the tasks they undertook on an annual basis was to give a fresh coat of paint in the early spring to nearby Fenway Park. At Dorchester, the Klein family settled into membership at Central Congregational Church, pastored by Norman King, who was a strong spiritual influence on Klein. Very early on, Klein distinguished himself as a brilliant student. He was enrolled in the prestigious public school nearby Boston Latin. Boston Latin claims to be the oldest school in America. Its founding in 1635 antedated Harvard College by a year. Ben Franklin, John Hancock, Samuel Adams were among its distinguished alumni. Klein, upon graduation, is offered scholarships to Harvard and Penn, but he chose instead Gordon College, which at the time was also located very close in the Fenway section of Boston near Kenmore Square. There he had a very active college life that included membership on the gospel team, the missionary society, and the yearbook. Even more remarkable was the amount of lay preaching that he engaged in. According to the 1944 Gordon College yearbook, Klein was the interim pastor or pulpit supply for several churches from Rhode Island to New Hampshire. His own records indicate he preached 55 times during his college experience. Perhaps most significantly in college, he meets and is quickly smitten by the daughter of a sixth principal Baptist church in Rhode Island. The six principles of this small denomination are found in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and final judgment. The Sixth Principal Baptist Church was a separatist denomination, so much so that it refused even to commune with other Baptist churches until 1954. Upon graduation, Klein married Grace Lamborn, his college sweetheart, and um, and then he was confronted with the choice of where to attend seminary. Now, at college, Klein did meet an Orthodox Presbyterian minister who was a longtime member of the Gordon faculty, Burton Goddard. If any of you are familiar with Gordon Conwell Seminary, you know that the library there is the Goddard Library. Goddard certainly had some influence on Klein. However, upon graduation, Klein's inclination was ministerial preparation at Dallas Theological Seminary. His mind only changed when his mother grieved at the prospect of his moving so far from home. So he changed his mind and he went to Westminster. There he immediately falls under the influence of New Testament professor Ned Stonehouse. In three years time, he earns a Bachelor of Divinity, that's the uh, equivalent to the MDiv today, and a THM. His senior paper, his, a study on the structure of the book of Revelation, is something we may be familiar with because Danny Olinger has published a helpful study of this in a series in Ordained Servant. Though Klein hadn't come from a Calvinistic background, he settled rather quickly into Reformed convictions at Westminster. One doctrine um, that was established early from his study of Revelation was his amillennial interpretation of prophecy. Now, how could it happen that a young man once bound for Dallas could come to this judgment so firmly? Well, here's a thought. Klein was a lifelong citizen of Red Sox Nation. Even in his Philadelphia exile, and his loyalty may have reinforced his amillennial convictions. Klein would constantly charge post-millennialism of positing a premature eclipse of the era of common grace, common curse, under which the world now functions. The end of which could only happen at the eschaton, and Red Sox fans knew that the eschaton could not be imminentized, being all too familiar with the curse of the Bambino. 
Somewhere I remember reading, although I can't remember where, that the novelist John Updike, who was also a Pennsylvanian who relocated to Massachusetts, Updike once observed that the curse of the Bambino established, and these are his words, a vague secular Calvinism in the thinking of New Englanders. My point is simply this. Boston may have been an environment that would be hospitable to Klein's eschatology. Now, it is true, I'll add, that Klein did live long enough to see the end of the curse when the Red Sox won the World Series in, 19, in 2004. However, I've yet to discover and don't expect to find any late in life conversion to post-millennialism. By the time, by his senior year at Westminster, Klein embraced Presbyterianism under the um, persuasive uh, voice of his, um, his friend, his, his, his professor and future colleague, Paul Woolley. Uh, he continues to be a very busy man. He's preaching often. His diary records 99 preaching occasions while at seminary. Klein was also raising a family. One year after his first year of marriage and um, his first year at Westminster, uh, his son Meredith M. Klein was born. A month after he graduated from Westminster, um, Sterling was born. And three years later, his third son, Calvin, was born. Now, when he graduates from Westminster in 1947, he entertained the prospect uh, of missions work in the OPC at the urging of several. But instead, he took a call at Calvary OPC in Ringo's, New Jersey, which afforded him the opportunity to enroll in a PhD program in a seriology at Dropsy College in Philadelphia under the tutelage of the renowned Ugaritic scholar Cyrus Gordon. That same year, he would also begin to teach Old Testament part-time at Westminster, joining the faculty full-time in 1950. Uh, this was a very busy man. Now, he mentioned his first article in 1953. Later that same year, he published uh, in the Westminster Journal a more technical piece, Intrusion and the Decalogue, a more elaborate defense of the uniqueness of the theocracies of the Old Testament, whether it's the Ark of Noah or the giving of the law on Sinai or the conquest of the promised land, these were eschatological intrusions of the ethics of the consummation in the era of this common grace, common curse. Uh, and Klein's approach here offers a fresh angle on some very difficult texts in the Old Testament. And uh, they give us an early sign of his very creative exegetical approach. Something else happens in 1953. Klein's senior colleague at Westminster, E.J. Young, goes on a year-long sabbatical. Though Klein was in the thick of dissertation writing, he jumped at the opportunity to teach courses that were normally Young's responsibility. In April of 1954, Klein wrote to Young about how much he enjoyed teaching the prophets and the Old Testament exegesis course. Uh, the exegesis course was typically based on Genesis. Klein apologized to Young for only getting as far as Genesis 2.8. Now, generations of Klein's Pentateuch students would come to understand that this was um, standard operating procedure. But here's what he says to Young. I hope you will not feel that irreparable damage was done in that course, but I was compelled to the conclusion that it was exegetically possible <clears throat> to treat the chronological data of Genesis 1 as constituting a figurative framework in which the material might be arranged topically. I prefer the latter as being, for one thing, in better agreement with the light of general revelation as known to us in our generation. <clears throat> E.J. Young was not pleased. When Klein's defense of the framework interpretation appeared in the Westminster Theological Journal, Young would produce a rebuttal in the journal, which together with three additional articles became his 
small book studies in Genesis 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, <clears throat> it was this article by Klein entitled Because It Had Not Rained that created the early impression that Klein was both creative and controversial. We might note, however, that while Klein continued, uh, for, uh, continued to teach the framework view, he didn't return to the subject in print for nearly four decades when he published an expanded analysis of the framework view in space and time in the Genesis cosmogony. <clears throat> he did, however, spend considerable time responding to letters from concerned pastors and lay people in the church. This 1960 letter is a representative sample. Klein wrote, what I wrote concerning the days of Genesis 1 was written in the conviction that it expressed the meaning of the infallible word of God. But my arguments do not persuade you. I do hope that I might reassure you that my interpretation was not suggested by any liberal unbelief with respect to the nature of the Holy Scriptures. In fact, one of the reasons I thought I, I thought it would, I thought it well to write opposing the 24-day theory was precisely that, as I understood the situation, such a theory is contradicted by the scriptures themselves, i.e., by the teaching of Genesis 2. <clears throat> and there can be no contradictions within the perfect word of God written. A young and inclined certainly differed in their interpretation of the creation days, but their disagreement was cordial <clears throat> and their families were close. Klein purchased land from Young and he built a home in Willow Grove where they became neighbors. Klein's respect for Young was perhaps best expressed in his review of Klein's commentary on Isaiah, which was completed only after Young's death. Klein wrote that while it may have lacked imagination and excitement, it breathes the spirit of humble adoration of the word of God. And it was solid, reliable, and thorough in its soundly reformed exegesis. This was to be sure a fitting tribute to Young, but it was somewhat atypical to Klein's book reviews because it is here where Klein would often a display uh, his pen at its most pointed. Um, a good example takes place in 1958 when Eternity Magazine, and you have to be of a certain age to remember Eter Eternity Magazine, which is now defunct. Eternity Magazine commissioned Klein to write a review of a two volume set by Arthur W. Pink on the life of David. Pink was a lay theologian whose Bible studies were beloved by a popular Reformed and evangelical audience. Klein was careful to meet the 400 word limit of his assignment, but that did not keep him from this devastating criticism. He writes, unfortunately, these studies by Pink are seriously marred by the pervasive use of allegorical interpretation. He is, of course, on biblical grounds when he interprets David in his capacity as king over the covenant people of his age as a type of Christ's kingship over the covenant people of all ages. But typology is one thing and allegory is another. And when Pink finds, for example, in countless incidental details of David's conflicts with his political enemies, types of the Christian believer's inner struggle against sin, he has passed from typology to allegory and has abandoned the reins of exegesis to wildest fancy. It is such undisciplined treasure hunting for types that has brought the whole principle of typology into disrepute. Now we see here Klein's interest in distinguishing Old Testament biblical theology from its counterfeits. But Eternity's readers did not see that because this review apparently was never published. Um, the uniqueness of the Israelite theocracy 
as Klein would, would understand it following Voss, carried consequences, theological, ecclesiastical, and political, that prompted Klein to embrace unpopular opinions. John Van Meerbeck is an Orthodox Presbyterian minister who was a student of Klein's at Gordon-Conwell, and he has cleverly suggested that a biography of Klein might be aptly titled Minority Report. I would qualify that in only one respect. Even better, it might be entitled Minority Reports in the plural. There were, I would identify, three episodes where Klein held a minority, minority report in the 1960s, two in a figurative sense and one in a literal sense. Episode one, in 1963, when Klein's sons were enrolled in the Abington Township Public Schools, it's a suburb north of Philadelphia. Um, in that year, when um, the younger Meredith was a high school senior, that was the year of the Supreme Court's landmark decision, Abington, from Abington Township, Abington versus Shemp ruling that mandatory prayer in public schools was a violation of the First Amendment. The case originated from a classmate of younger Meredith, whose parents were atheists. The elder Klein objected to the practice of reading scripture, reciting the Lord's Prayer, and the Pledge of Allegiance that was piped into homerooms every morning with daily school announcements. He protested not to protect the interests of atheists, but because the practice violated the rights of all religious minorities, including a very large Jewish population attending the school. We can also uh, say that his logic was similar to J. Gresson Machen's unwillingness to entrust religious exercises to public educators. So he supported the ruling to the, to the dismay of many in the OPC. He did, not, he did not make any effort to broadcast his support loudly. The only record of his addressing the subject is found in a diary entry in 1960, when he spoke on a panel of the North Pennsylvania Ministerial Association. In the following year, Klein, serving on the committee on foreign missions of the OPC, literally submitted a re minority report to the 31st General Assembly regarding a proposal to establish a medical hospital in the OPC mission in Eritrea. Now, I won't say much about the substance, substance of this debate because I understand Danny Olinger will refer to it in his presentation, but uh, I will note that for many commissioners this, at this General Assembly, this was perhaps their first exposure to Klein's prose. And what they heard was some classic rhetorical flourishes from his pen. Just a few. He wonders, if we're going to have these doctors in the mission, what do we call them? Well, perhaps deacons. But then he... He says that won't work. He writes, however, since there is no biblical evidence of deacons or any others practicing ordinary medicine as an official ecclesiastical function, what the modern church has actually done is to invent the new office of ecclesiastical medic. Now, if you do that, presumably, he goes on, the church will desire to practice medicine according to the present state of the art. And that becomes a fourth mark of the true church. It gets worse. It will then probably be the latest medical journals that are elevated to the position of the standards of the church alongside the Bible, which means the scriptures will no longer be the sole authority and rule in the government of the church. Finally, when the church usurps to itself from the sphere of the human culture, the functions of medicine, it involves itself in the it involves itself in the relativism, the uncertainties, and the fallacies of expert human opinion and reputes the character and, and repudiates the character of absolute divine sovereignty that is the glory of its true ministry. So 
So a lot's at stake here, Klein is saying. Now, here's the really odd part about this episode. Klein did not actually present this report. He was not a commissioner to this General Assembly. So it fell to the stated clerk, Robert Eckerd, to read the 2,600-word report. The order of the day, the day's adjournment for dinner, had to be extended for the completion of the reading of this report. Klein's nuanced, nuanced argument may have been lost on many empty stomachs. After a full morning of debate the next day, Klein's minority report did not prevail. The vote is not recorded. We don't know by how many, but I don't think it was close. Several ministers, however, wrote to him expressing their appreciation for his efforts. But after the vote, he was not reelected to the Committee on Foreign Missions, and he never appeared, he never attended another General Assembly. A couple of weeks after um, the assembly, Christianity Today ran a brief article on the OPC General Assembly and an editorial that applauded the decision, yet lampooned the fact that a church-sponsored medical mission was even debatable. The editorial went on to suggest that it was a very heated debate. Perhaps the editors had access to Klein's report. A month later, Christianity Today ran excerpts from letters from Klein and Herbert Byrd. Herbert Byrd spoke on behalf of the prevailing majority. Both of these letters by Klein and Byrd sought to um, correct the record. But more significantly, both, le both letter writers took pains to protect the reputation of the other. This is a remarkable display of collegiality that we would do well to recover at our General Assemblies today. The third minority report that I'm identifying in the 60s is perhaps the most significant. Klein began to commit to print his disagreements with Professor John Murray's teaching on covenant theology. Murray was, of course, Klein's systematic theology professor at Westminster. Murray preached at the ordination of Meredith Klein in 1948, and he would preach again at a special service in 1963 on the occasion of the inauguration of both Meredith Klein and Edmund Clowney to full professors at Westminster. But difficulties were, emer were emerging between them. Dick Gaffin has vivid memory of a conversation he had with John Murray in 1965. Gaffin is sure of the year because it was the one year when he and Murray overlapped on the faculty, Gaffin's first, Murray's last. In response to uh, a question from Gaffin about a Klein article that would eventually be a chapter in his book by Oath Consigned, Murray's response was this, beware of architectonic constructions. Beware of architect architectonic constructions. Gaffin told me he could not help but ponder the irony of a professor of systematic theology being concerned about an Old Testament professor in this way. With the state of biblical studies today in the academy, the rare architectonic construction might be welcomed by systematicians. What did Murray mean? Well, we get a clue when By Oath Consign is published in 1968. There, Klein takes specific exception to Murray's definition of a covenant with his restrictive formula, a sovereign administration of grace and promise. But Klein does this in a gentle way. He writes, among Orthodox theologians, there has been a line of those who would frame the covenant concept in unilateral fashion with exclusive emphasis on divine initiative and promise. Klein goes on to write, the systematic theologian must beware lest his proper concern for the unity and continuity of the divine covenants or for the sovereignty of God in the covenant relationship blur or even virtually obliterate um, in his thought, the distinct identity of the Sinaitic covenant as a particular administration 
with his own historical beginning in a concrete occasion of covenant making. That's a very long sentence. What he's saying that Murray's formulation is in effect an overcorrection to the discontinuities of dispensationalism. Now, in a footnote, this is what Klein says. The observations at this point above take account especially of the discussion of the matter by John Murray. And here is the key line. Though venturing to differ from Professor Murray in this regard, I would like to acknowledge with appreciation my indebtedness to him for illumination of the things of most import, of most import in our relationship to our covenant Lord. Murray is a revisionist. Klein is likely referring to Murray's Tyndale lecture that came into print in the booklet, The Covenant of Grace. There Murray wrote, theology must always be undergoing reformation. The human understanding is imperfect. There always remains the need for correction and reconstruction so that the structure may be brought into closer approximation to the scripture and the reproduction be more faith, a more faithful transcript or reflection of the heavenly exemplar. It appears to me that covenant theology needs recasting. Now, it may be difficult today to appreciate fully what it would have meant to take on John Murray back in the day like this. No Westminster professor, not even Cornelius Van Til, was esteemed by Westminster faculty, students, and alumni, not to mention the OPC at large, than Professor Murray. I recognize that may be tantamount to heresy at a reform forum, forum gathering, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Klein was, some, was emerging as an outlier, a man with uh, many and maybe too many minority reports. Now, um, decades later, Klein would be given to criticizing Murray less gently because Murray's errors in his covenant construction provided cover for the massive confusion of Norman Shepard's teaching on justification. Few thoughts on that in a few minutes. I'm getting ahead of the story. But all the while, E.J. Young is still chairman of the Old Testament department, and he was teaching the classes that Klein yearned to teach. As cordial as their relationship was, Klein was getting frustrated. He loved to play the violin, but he was not content with being second fiddle. Sorry, bad pun. As early as 1958, an invitation to join the faculty at Gordon Divinity School was extended to Klein. This prompted a rather revealing response from Klein. Listen to what he wrote. The decision your letter has confronted me with is very difficult indeed. The prospect of teaching at Gordon Divinity School is exceedingly attractive to me. There are ties to alma mater, the proximity to my folks in Boston, and a surprisingly poignant longing to return to New England, which never ceases to be home to me, no matter how long I have my residence here in these barbarian hinterlands. However, Klein went on. I judge that I ought not leave Westminster for a teaching position elsewhere, unless it appeared that a new position offered larger opportunities of advancing the theological cause which I espouse. The opportunity for enlarged service, which might justify my leaving Westminster, does not seem to exist at Gordon at the present time. Klein was getting other offers um, from other institutions. This was not unusual. This was probably true of most of his colleagues as well. I know it was true with Van Til. Constantly, he was um, getting invitations to um, consider teaching elsewhere. Now, Klein resisted temptation in 1958. When an invitation came in 1964, Klein could no longer resist. 
After 16 years at Westminster, his family moved to Wenham, Massachusetts, where he became chair of the Old Testament Department at Gordon Divinity School, now known as Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. He could now chair a department, and he reckoned that Gordon had become now an enlarged platform, and that would certainly prove to be that. But it was also a terrible blow to Westminster. Among the many letters from friends and colleagues regretting his leaving but wishing him well, wishing him well one letter stands out to me. It came from Norman Hofflinger, a, West, a Wisconsin minister in the Reformed Church in the U.S. Eureka classes and a member of the Board of Trustees at Westminster. Hofflinger wrote these words to Klein. I hope that you will continue to remember Westminster. And as for my part there, there will always, as, as for my part, there will always be a place for you there at Westminster. Hofflinger had no idea the extent to which Klein would continue to remember Westminster. Last summer, uh, Danny Olinger and I had the privilege of uh, having, enjoying a lunch with Rick Linz, um, longtime professor, now retired of theology at Gordon-Conwell, a colleague of Klein for, for decades. And um, Rick told us that he and David Wells would joke that Klein cared far more about what was taking place at a faculty meeting at Westminster than what was happening at faculty meetings at Gordon-Conwell. Uh, and that is gonna prove true in um, the events that follow. Another frequent letter writer stands out. Bob Dendalk was the business manager at Westminster. Dendalk would later move to Escondido where he'd be the business manager and then president for a time at Westminster, California, Westminster Seminary, California. He would write to Klein often. Now let's stop there and think about this. Why is the business manager constantly writing to Meredith Klein? Well, they were close friends to be sure, but that's not all. It's because he was acknowledging Klein's frequent financial gifts to Westminster. Klein continued to remember Westminster. And every thank you note ended with words to this effect. We are already waiting for your return home. Time to think about coming home. I hope you will not give up the idea of returning. Two years into his teaching at Gordon, Klein responded to Dendulk in with remarkable candor. My first impressions of Gordon, he wrote, are continually confirmed. The total theological impact on the students is very mixed. Especially disturbing to me is the babble of viewpoints heard in chapel services. I believe that whatever I can contribute by way of exposing evangelical students to reform thinking is worthwhile service. But some days, I admit, the environment seems discouraging and I could wish to be in my theological home. They may have been the barbarian hinterlands, but there was a, still a sense to him that this was his home. And then the next year, the shocking telegram arrived from Dendulk on February 15, 1968. Dr. Young passed away last evening of a heart attack. Funeral arrangements are pending. Many faculty, especially Cornelius Van Til, leapt at the opportunity to urge him to return. Van Til wrote constantly. Uh, the dean wrote to him. The dean at the time was Norman Shepard. Uh, there are letters from um, Claire Davis, Dick Gaffin, Paul Woolley. There is some evidence that Klein weighed this uh, prospect seriously, but he declined, and that largely for family reasons. Yet he never lost his love for Westminster. And in fact, this would initiate for several years his service 
to uh, teach at Westminster as a visiting professor. Now, as we get into um, the 70s, um, we're going to see some subtle shifting in um, Klein's rhetoric. It's common uh, for um, some Kleinians to refer to uh, an early Klein and a later Klein. Uh, what that language uh, points to is the subtle way uh, he changed his description of the Mosaic Covenant, where, um, where in the 70s, he tended to refer to the Mosaic Covenant as an administration of the covenant of grace embedded with a typological works principle. A decade later, he was given to say that the Mosaic Covenant was a republication of the covenant of works. Now, I don't think these two expressions are contradictory. I think that they are easily harmonizable, but clearly and his emphasis is shifting. And two theological antagonists that refined his thinking here were the theonomy movement and Norman Shepard's novel views on justification. Klein's criticism of theonomy appeared in his 1979 Westminster Theological Journal review article of theonomy in Christian ethics, a product of what he called in the review, the overheated typewriter of Greg Bonson. The tragedy of Chalcedon, as he called it, in failing properly to apprehend the theocracy of Israel extended to its delusive and grotesque perversion of the teaching of scripture. That's a colorful way of saying that the enemy engages in a holy, in a holy common confusion. This is the old new error that um, is the title of this review article. And once again, he's reminding us we must take note of the relevance of the theocracy. Now, along the way, Klein takes a sh shot at post-millennialism. By its premature eclipse of the order of common grace, post-millennialism denies the faithfulness of God, who under the terms of the Noahic covenant has committed himself to preserving common grace. Now, there's one more thing I want to point, about this review, point out about this review, which I find, frankly, disappointing. Klein unhelpfully and unnecessarily concedes to Bonson that the Westminster Standards contain theonomic tendencies that obscure the holy common distinction. I don't think that's a concession he had to make. I think that, among other things, the American... Uh, revisions of the standards clarify the matter. But my point is that if Murray is recasting covenant theology, Klein is, for his part, suggesting a revision of the Westminster Standards. This brings us to the teaching of Norman Shepard. Debate over um, Shepard's views at Westminster began in 1975 and continued until Shepard was terminated by the seminary in 1982. Uh, Norman had Meredith as a professor. Um, Norman Shepard joined the faculty at Westminster in 1963. He was Murray's um, successor, and he overlapped with Klein for a couple of years, but he was only 11 years younger than Klein. We don't have time to do full justice to the debate and Klein's invol involvement in it, but um, here is yet another occasion when Klein's interest in the affairs of Westminster are far greater than his interest of, of matters at Gordon Conwell, his employer. It is interesting that a parallel episode is taking place at Gordon Conwell. After teaching at Gordon Conwell for 25 years, New Testament professor J. Ramsey Michaels resigned just ahead of being fired when the faculty senate issued a report criticizing Michael's view of inerrancy based on his book, Servant and Son. The prosecution was led by Roger Nicole and David Wells. Klein didn't play an active role, but he certainly agreed with the decision and surely he must have lamented Westminster's failure to gain clarity on the controversy as Gordon Conwell managed to do. 
In this long discussion about Shepard's view, the focus fell on his controversial 34 theses on justification, which he produced and distributed in 1978. The faculty debated it. The board debated it. I was a student at the time. We were um, rather baffled by it. In the interest of reaching a resolution, President Clowney convened a small gathering in a Lancaster County Inn late in 1978, away from the seminary campus. Attendees included Clowney, Norman Shepard, Robert Strimple, the Dean at the time, Robert Godfrey, Richard Gaffin, and Meredith Klein, serving as a visiting professor. Now, progress was made, according to some participants, some progress was made until Shepard dropped a bombshell when he claimed that it was possible for a believer to lose his justification. This is implied in one of the theses, but he says it explicitly at this gathering. And it was clear to several, including Klein, that Shepard's view must be read, Shepard's theses must be read in the context of his broader and flawed covenantal framework. Um, as Klein put it, the believer, just like Israel, according to Shepard, has a covenant election that may become reprobation. Klein goes on, Professor Shepard posits a simple equivalence between the national election of Israel and the individual election to eternal salvation, calling this one variety of election the only kind that figures, according to Professor Shepard. In what we say about the historical realm, covenant election, it's one and the same. And he concludes from the fact that elect Israel became reprobate Israel, that in covenant election, wherever it's found, it may be losable. For Klein, the root of Shepard's error was his covenant confusion where works and grace are mixed in the Old Covenant, the same problem ensues in the New Covenant. But getting to the heart of Shepard's covenant confusion was not possible because Clowney insisted that any discussion of Shepard's views must be limited to the 34 Theses. No broader discussion of the theology that framed these Theses were to be, were to, were to be allowed. As a result, Shepard was vindicated not once, not twice, but three times by the board. And this frustrated Klein to, new, to no end. At a 1980, I'm sorry, at a 1987 board meeting, a motion that the formulation of the 34 theses was not in accord with the standards lost by one vote. At a 1979 board meeting, a motion passed that there is no sufficient cause to pursue further its inquiry into the teaching of Norman Shepard. That passed 11 to 8. At a December 1980 meeting of the board, a procedural nightmare took place in the form of three motions. First, a motion to exonerate Shepard failed by a board tie vote of 11 to 11. A second motion asking that Shepard resign failed by a vote of 13 to 9. A third motion that he be exonerated with the added clause that he exercised care in expressing his views passed by a vote of 13 to 9. In desperation, Klein joined others. 44 others, including trustees, faculty, and alumni, in a May 4, 1981 open letter to several hundred friends of the Reformed faith. It deplored, this letter deplored the action of the board and sought to give a clear and unambiguous testimony to the truth of the gospel of grace for the good of Westminster and the Reformed community. Later that month, the Westminster faculty fired back with a unanimous response that charged the letter as contrary to the spirit of the gospel and prejudicial 
to the truth concerning the views of Norman Shepard. Now, what would end up happening at the very end of 1981 was that Shepard was finally dismissed when Clowney, having listened to the tapes of Shepard's classroom instruction, concluded that his views were in fact out of accord with the Westminster standards. The board's announcement of the dismissal contained a chastisement to the writers of the May 4th letter. But in explaining its action, it also employed without citation or acknowledgement, the very arguments raised by Klein at the Downington Conference. Klein, at this point, cut off his relationship with Philadelphia entirely. Uh, he no longer felt there was room for him at Westminster after all. Now, um, he would still continue to remember Westminster because beginning in 1981, Klein taught two courses, Pentateuch and the Prophets, at Westminster Seminary, California in Escondido in the spring semesters, and he would do that for two decades. It is here where Klein produced his most fruitful work, and I would go further to say that he would say he also enjoyed the company of his brightest students. Now, I said his most fruitful work, but not his most accessible work. Klein's um, last several books were self-published. He lacked an editor, which the best of writers need. And so his students are often given to lamenting that Klein has yet to be translated into English. Um, <clears throat> Regarding Klein's writing style, I think Pastor Zach Keel, pastor of Escondido OPC, offers a wise assessment. Uh, and this comes in a form of challenges, challenging us how we should read Klein. Keel writes, it is not unusual to hear Klein's writing is difficult and inaccessible, but another estimate is more fitting. Although he may use language that is unfamiliar in everyday parlance, and he enjoys his hyphens, Dr. Klein can weave together beautifully rich sentences where form and meaning are wonderfully matched. In this way, Klein resembled the authors he spent so much time studying, the prophets. The black belt skill of the prophets was the rhetorical creativity they pulled from the law and culture around them to foretell the greater realities to come. Meredith Klein was a student who followed the example of his teachers. Pick up Klein, Zeal, uh, Zach says, pick up Klein, not just to learn, but to enjoy. Well, a few concluding thoughts. Klein sustained attention to the relevance of the theocracy. His defense of covenant theology when it fell under attack. His minority reports, his architectonic constructions. All of these serve what we could call his legibility project. Legibility does not refer to his handwriting. Whether on the chalkboard or the whiteboard, his writing was hardly legible. He's leaning on a broader definition Legibility as, as um, discernibility, as capable of being understood. Legibility was the term he often invoked to describe the purpose of the Old Testament. Here is how he put it in his magnum opus, Kingdom Prologue. Within the limits, within the limitations, I should say, Within the limitations of the fallen world and with modifications peculiar to the redemptive process, the old theocratic kingdom was a reproduction of the original covenantal order. Israel as a theocratic nation was mankind stationed once again in a paradise sanctuary under the probation of the covenant of works. In the context of that situation, the incarnation event became legible. Apart from it, 
apart from the, theocrat, the, the theocracy, the meaning of the appearing and ministry of the Son of Man would hardly have been perspicuous. Because of the congruence between Jesus' particular historical identity as the new Israel, born under the law, and his universally relevant role as the second Adam, the significance of his mission as the accomplishing, as the, as the accomplishing of a probationary assignment in a works covenant on behalf of the elect of all ages became lucidly expressed and readily readable. The work of Christ was legible because of the typology of Israel. The theocracy remains relevant because it makes, it makes legible the universally relevant work of the second Adam. Now, this puts a particular burden on the Old Testament interpreter. When exegesis runs wild with allegory, or when the covenant of works is denied, the legibility of the greater son of David and the true Israel, our Lord Jesus Christ, is obscured. This is what Klein means by legibility. What was the effect of Klein's legibility project on his students? Let me close with one of my favorite Klein stories. About three decades ago, I met a PCA pastor who had graduated from Gordon-Conwell Seminary in the mid-70s. This was the time when I had attended Gordon College. So we exchanged pleasant memories of mutual friends and similar experiences of Boston's bucolic North Shore. Klein was right in um, adoring this piece of real estate. But when I asked my friend about seminary life, he proceeded to describe each of his professors. And he was remarkably particular about what each had taught him. Roger Nicole had instructed him on the significance of definite atonement. Richard Lovelace had taught him to love the Puritans. Gwyn Walters oppressed upon him the importance of pulpit rhetoric, and so on. My friend just went down the faculty at Gordon Conwell, in each case mentioning a very specific feature of his instruction. The longer he went, the more Klein grew conspicuous by his absence. I was growing a bit uneasy. After all, I knew that Klein was not universally esteemed by the students at Gordon Conwell. So finally, I had to ask him, did you have Klein? Oh, yes, of course, he said. And uh, what did you learn from Klein? <laughs> well, Klein taught me how to read the Bible. That's legibility. That's the relevance of Meredith Klein today. He is still teaching students how to read the Bible. Thank you.